Um, good morning in India and good night in the US and wherever you are, John. I don't know what time of day it is. Oh, good night. I'm in, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> um, it's such a deep pleasure to um, invite Derek Jensen and Vandana Shiva to this event and to hear them speak today. <laughs> Thanks to Zoom, these things are possible. That people in India have a chance to connect with people in the US and uh, I'm finding it all very strange. Um, I'm not going to introduce uh, Derek and Vandana right now. I think you've read the, the, uh, the, the mails that have been sent out and they're so well known, both of them. Um, I would like to thank Leo and uh, Environment Support Group, um, Sana, Bhargavi, Varun, and all the students who are putting together this uh, event today. I would like to thank Joe, Joe Atiali of uh, CENFA, uh, Center for Financial Accountability for giving us the Zoom account. Uh, it's completely incredible to see the range of people who've um, joined into today's uh, discussion and conversation from activists to teachers, food growers, restorationists, scientists, health practitioners, uh, friends, family. <laughs> I'm sad though that people from our respective indigenous and traditional land bases cannot be part of it due to the languages, uh, the language issue and technology issue, but we'll make it possible to, to uh, share all this with, uh, with people at home. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping is just that everybody should be on mute and if the, there is a connectivity issue then to stop your video um, and since it's on Facebook as well that uh, there's a whole team of people who will moderate some of the comments and then share it with Leo and me so that we can then um, present it to uh, Vandana and Leo. So I'd like to move on to setting the tone. Um, our planet, our home is on fire. And every part of this home of ours is under assault. To be born today is to be born on a battlefield. Whether you're a butterfly, a polar bear, a human, a little plant, a river, or even a virus. To be alive today is to be warred upon in all kinds of ways and the reverse too. To be human today is to participate directly or indirectly in the war on others. Everything we touch with money means there is blood on our hands. Everything we use that has come through the machinery of the industrial world has ecocide or genocide in its making. More than half of humankind today is in survival mode, despite the so-called progress and sustainable development goals touted by leaders of every country. And things are getting worse, much worse. Ecologically, the indicators of crises are hitting the red all the time. And so much has gone already. Like Derek says, more than 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. Most of the old growth forests are gone and what remains is being shred. And we humans with our beautiful, precious biped bodies are under assault too. From the radiation on our screens to junk food to unacceptable levels of pollutions, uh, illnesses, disorders and chronic conditions caused by the modern world to wars and escalating surveillance and control by governments of their own citizens to the wholesale genocide and ecocide of ancient and present day communities of humans and non-humans. So this is the context in which we have called for this meeting. So what is to be done? The need of the hour is so great and it increases with every second. Both Vandana and Derek have called for intervention ever since I've known their work. And also they have intervened in all kinds of ways. Many people and groups have organized themselves around both Vandana and Derek. And of course, we have organized ourselves around other work too, sharing a similar ethos. 
indigenous peoples and traditional peoples have shown the way, not only in the past, but right now, some of the fiercest opposition to the system is from them. And, um, and the rest of us can learn what it takes to defend the land base and what, what it means to live sustainably. The main question for today is how do we build on this even more purposefully and strategically taking into account everything that has been done till now? And underneath the real question, how do we deal with structural power? How do we bring it to an end? Because every day that it has its, its way, more and more destruction is unleashed. So of course, within this question of structural power, there's a crowd of questions. I'll just run through, you know, for those of us who are alive, are we going to collapse and cave in from victimhood and fatalism, meek acceptance that this is the way, so be it? Is there another way? Are humans inevitably cruel and psychopathic? What do we need to do so that life on earth, including human life on earth, has a chance of outlasting this monstrous assault? Where do we place our faith? How do we shape our action? How do we find the courage we so desperately need to defend those we have? Sorry, sorry. Supi, you've been you've been muted. Supi, you've been muted. Okay, where did I? Sorry, uh, we are trying to mute it. Uh, so can I just request everyone who's joining to please turn off their microphones so that more sentences, please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I don't know where I. Last was heard. Four sentences, please. The last two, three sentences. Yeah. Okay. Are humans inevitably cruel and psychopathic? What do we need to do so that life on earth, including human life on earth, has a chance of outlasting this monstrous assault? Where do we place our faith? How do we shape our action? How do we find the courage we so desperately need to defend those whom we love? Is it inevitable that all this beauty should go? Is life on earth doomed? So these are the questions that led me to re read Endgame, Derek's fierce indictment of civilization more than 10 years ago. I've followed Vandana since I was a teenager, connecting with her principles of earth democracy and ecofeminism and seed power. Both have articulated the problems of the world with love and unassailable argument. Their courage and work have led to movements ranging from resistance and opposition to supporting land-based communities and regenerative interbeing with the rest of the natural world. Both their work has spiritual resonance, is rooted in the sacred, and both stand in defense of the natural world and human community. Um, so I was wondering if we could just begin, uh, Vandana, with this, if you could share uh, the spiritual core of your work. I don't mean religious, I mean spiritual. And then if Derek could then join you after that. Vandana, you're, you're muted. Knowing we are part of an amazing interconnected universe. Uh, and this universe is living, uh, it's sacred, and protecting it and defending it is our sacred duty. To me, ecological defense of life is spirituality in action. Great. Derek? I guess a couple quick, quick things. One is that um, so many indigenous people have said to me over the, the decades now that the fundamental difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is that for the most part, even the most open-minded Westerners, whatever, however we want to define that, the most open-minded of members of the dominant culture perceive listening to the land as a metaphor, as opposed to the way that the world 
really is. And for the most part, we are inculcated into believing that the world consists of resources to be exploited as opposed to other beings to enter into relationship with. And that is a, uh, how you perceive the world affects how you behave in the world. And I remember several years ago, I, I live in a town on the coast and there was an article in the newspaper about how the reason that crabbers work so hard during the crabbing season is that every crab was worth a dollar fifty. And in the newspaper, they said, so if there were all these envelopes all over the ground, each one had a dollar fifty in it, you would run around as fast as you can to try to pick up as many envelopes as you can. And that's all fine, except that a crab is not actually an envelope full of money. A crab is a being with a life as valuable to it as yours is to you and mine is to me. And the same is true for every tree, every bacteria. Um, and if you perceive the world as consisting of resources to exploit, you will exploit the world. And if you perceive the world as consisting of other beings to enter into relationship with, then you will enter into relationship with them. Vandana, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I would, uh, you know, uh, just like to add that you know, the West was spiritual. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's that self interconnectedness of being that was most carried by women. And it was not an act. The, the witch hunts were part of the engineering of the separation. We don't normally see it as that, but the witch hunts were the early stages of creating a Western mind that be started to become afraid of living and knowing uh, ourselves and a sacred universe. And this then went on, of course, colonialism followed. And if you look, I mean, because each of us has been locked into our particular cultures, we, we study them in a linear line, separate from other uh, flows. And if you think of it, just at the time when the East India Company was created to invade India, is exactly when the enclosures of the commons were happening in uh, England. And for the people, the peasants of, uh, of England, the land was sacred, it was common, it had to be taken care of. And when Boyle was appointed the new uh, go uh, England governor of the church or whatever it was at that time, he actually says very clearly that, and I've written about all this in my book, Staying Alive, because when I wanted to understand how is it that the women of Chipko can come out and defend the forests, putting their lives at risk, saying, you'll have to kill us before you kill the tree, and how is it that a forestry system imposed on an Aranya Sanskriti, which is what Tagore said, that we are a civilization of the forest. We're different because we did not come from learning locked in prisons of brick and, brick and mortar. We learned from the forest. At that time, we had been taught that the forests are timber mine. Now we've been taught forests are plantations. And everywhere there's offsetting going on just yesterday. They cut down a tribal forest in Orissa for an industrial plantation. So Bacon writes at that time, in the early stages of creating the industrial mind, which is the mechanistic mind, which is the foundation of an extractive industrial economy, uh, and the foundation of a, a very aggressive acceleration of colonialism, which began before that, he writes about the birth of masculine time, or the masculine birth of time. Again, separation as an expression of masculine power over nature. And Boyle says the idea of a sacred nature that the natives are imbued with comes in the way of our creating an empire. Our creating an empire over lesser creatures. So I...
Dankjewel. Bandana, I think that we've been muted. Oh, see, this is the problem with remote control. You know, Gandhi wrote. Muted. Yeah. Yeah. So when my speaking is under control of some anonymous bar, um, you know, that's a choice I don't want to make. I don't want my ability to communicate to be in someone's control. And the sad thing is, the Boyles and the Bacons and the Columbuses and the Clives of today are the five tech giants who control our communication. And of our being is taking place right now. And it is what we are our spiritual powers are because they want us to be dumb addendums to their machines, nothing more. Earlier, the first colonialism turned us into objects, turned nature into an object to control. Now, they don't even give us the fullness of a full object. And the craziest, if the British brought to India the system of Lagan that created, um, basically 60 million people died in that period of the British rule through manufactured famines. Got rid of famines, we're coming back to famines. I think it's extremely important to recognize that now, you know, we are not even um, full, we aren't beings, we are not sacred beings, but we are just, we are the new to, uh, um, reflections for biodiversity day. We, we as human beings, our bodies and mind are the new mind. We are the new raw material. And instead of being pushed without thinking or being pushed by accepting this new slavery and this new digital dictatorship, including control over our voice, what they'll decide is true and what is false is fact checking systems set up by Facebook and Gates. It's such an amazing universe we are looking in. And where do you get your truth? You get your truth through your spiritual being and your interconnectedness with life. So more, I mean, for sanity now in this absolutely crazy world, we need to go in and connect to the inner beings of all life. Wow. <laughs> Um, before I just go on to asking Derek uh, to expand on this question, can we do some housekeeping, please? Because it's terrible if the speakers or any of us uh, is muted when they're in the middle of something really important. Leo, can we see to it, please? Uh, may I just ask, Vandana, what is the handle through which you are talking? Because we don't see you here. Well, I'm seeing I'm right here. I'm, so, I'm seeing Vandana. I'm right here. <laughs> right, so it has a mysterious number on me. I am four. Mr. Microsoft has made me four seven five four four three six one seven. I'm not Vandana. Ah, okay, so that's what we see. We don't see Vandana Shiva there. Okay? I don't know why you don't see me. <laughs> I don't know why also. But nevertheless, I think these are the kind of problems we have. Not a number. I'm not a number. I'm a being. Not definitely a number. <laughs> Never be a number. Uh, okay, so we got that. Uh, that's you. <laughs> make sure that you are protected by making your co-host. Uh, Derek, uh, again, may I ask you, where is your handle? Because I don't see your name. He's Derry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Microsoft Did decided you know that I was Derry. And <laughs> Derry I must be. Sure enough. Now we will call you by your real names. Okay. So Vandana, you won't be disturbed now. Uh, yeah. We saw a number and sometimes numbers mean somebody's trying to spam uh, and somebody's trying to destroy this forum. Uh, so one request to everyone who's joining, please ensure your audio is off. And if your bandwidth is low, make sure that your video is off as well.
Thank you. Derek, could you add to this of how the separation and the disconnect has happened over time and, and what is it that we need to watch out for? Um, one of the ways that I think it's happened over time is, I mean, there are, there are a bunch of ways, but, but, but one of the ones that I think about a lot was the uh, creation of an Abrahamic sky god who, well, first, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, Peggy Reeve Sande uh, did a, a study cross-culturally of why some cultures are high rape and some are low rape. And I mean, there are cultures where the rates of rape are very high and, and other cultures where it's either very low or, or non-existent. And she found that the, the, the cultures with a very high rate of rape often had many things in common. They were highly militarized, which makes sense, um, or are highly militarized. Um, men are valued and women are devalued. Uh, the work of women is devalued. Um, the, uh, one of the things that's very interesting, which is not gonna be my point, is that there's a history of ecological dislocation in the last few hundred years, um, which, which has ramifications we can talk about later if you want. But the, the one that I wanna focus on right now is um, one of the indicators or markers, one of the, the common factors of a high rape culture is to have a male creator deity instead of either a couple creator deity or a female creator deity. And I remember when Judith Herman told me that list, she just stopped for a second and she talked about how uh, counterintuitive it is to come up with the notion of a solely creator, a solely male creator. I mean, it's, it's fairly clear that women are the ones who give birth and women or females across species are, are the, 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 the primary, I mean, that, that's where, that's where life comes from. And so it's quite a, a coup to be able to transfer that to a male, to a male being the, the, the source of all life. But anyway, one of the problems is when you get a, a distant sky god that takes meaning from the world itself that, oh, I want to tell a story real quick. Years ago, I was on an airplane and the plane got, uh, had a mechanical problem. So they pulled us all off the plane and put us on the plane again. And uh, I ended up sitting next to this guy who was reading a Bible and uh, he would slip little pieces of paper into the flight attendant's pockets when they walked by. And I saw some of the pieces of paper that, that had uh, little biblical verses on them. And he was, uh, he kept trying to nudge me to get me to look at him so he could talk to me. And I was holding a book in between us to like make it so he couldn't talk to me. And Finally, he got tired of nudging me and he, he grabbed me by the leg and said, do you know why God rearranged the seating on this plane? And I was thinking, oh, here we go. It's a long flight. This is going to be very bad. And fortunately, I was quick witted in the moment, which doesn't happen very often. And I said, yes, God rearranged the seating on the plane so that I could tell you all about the importance of animism. And he put his Bible in between us and, and we didn't speak again for the entire flight. Um, but the, the point is that if you can remove if you can remove meaning from the redwood trees and from the voles and from the bats, and if you can put that meaning into somebody who is way out there, and this planet is just a veil of tears that we must endure so that we can get to the real world which is heaven, the real reward, instead of heaven being here on earth, that's an extraordinary, you have paved the way, literally, for 
the destruction of everything. You've removed the sacredness from the place you live, the place you are, and you put it out there. And that was really the heavy lifting. And after that, it was very easy for science to come along and just turn out the lights and say, oh, there's no meaning out there either. And that's, that's part of our problem is that, you know, I, I guess I wanna mention David Ehrenfeld's The Arrogance of Humanism for a moment, that actually the meaning did not go away from the universe when they moved from the, the religious notion of heaven out there, instead it moved to a secular notion of heaven, which is a technotopian future. And the uh, <coughs> heaven that we're anticipating is no longer a long ways away, but instead it is in the future when technology makes everything perfect. And so really, what happened was at first, the gods were the mice and the rabbits and the falcons. And then later the gods were an Abrahamic God. And now the gods are the machines and, um, and our own self uh, inflated sense of importance in the world. Uh, super Bob. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think a male God put in the skies isn't the way the Abrahamic religions evolved. Um, you know, in Florence, if you go to the churches and if you go to the museums or if you go to Greece or you go to uh, um, Ethiopia, you go to where Orthodox Christianity is. Um, the centerpiece of all the churches and all the paintings of the period of the Renaissance is Mary. And Jesus is her baby. And it's just as much as the economy has been hijacked from being the art of living to be the art of money making. You know, Aristotle distinguished between these two in Greek times. He said, economy is the art of living. Crematistics is the art of money making. What we call economy today is just the art of brutal, violent money making as war. When you started Suprabha and you talked about we're living in a battlefield because the economy as money making has substituted religion. It substituted the art of living. It has substituted our sense of being in a sacred universe. But take it even further. We did a manifesto in the year of Saul, 2015. It's also the year when the refugee boats were sinking in the Mediterranean. And I was very keen to put these two processes together and say, uh, to understand what is it that has happened to the land, to the soil, to be driving so many people off the land as refugees. And the two things that we've written about, it's available on the Navdanya International website, Terra Viva, our soil, our commons, our future. The first that actually is the destruction of the land that created the refugee crisis. Syria, 2009, uh, severe drought added to the, the green revolution uh, style, agriculture creating water famine, as it has done in water abundant Punjab, land of famine. Everywhere there's water famine, wherever chemical farming is gone, the land gets desertified. And it takes one severe drought to make the system collapse, which is what happened in 2009. For two years, it was the farmers protesting. A million became refugees in Syria. And then, of course, the military opportunists found here uh, opportunity for perpetual war against an enemy. They have no idea who's fighting whom anymore. But even Lake Chad, 22,000 square kilometers of water, 80% diverted to globalized commodity farming. The lake st starts to run dry. And the way it has happened in Africa, you know, the settled agriculturists were changed to Christianity. The nomads stayed Islamic. And before you know it, pastoral 
conflicts with settled agriculturists over scarcity of water was presented as a religious conflict, just as much as the Punjab violence of 1984, which triggered me to study the Green Revolution and write the book, The Violence of the Green Revolution. There was no religious issue involved. There was no communal issue involved. It was about the soil, the land, the water. And as the farmers have said, we are living under slavery. If we don't decide what we'll grow, because the Green Revolution package was created by the Rockefellers and the Fords and the USAIDs and the World Banks, we don't determine how we'll grow it. With chemicals, it was compulsory. We don't determine what price we'll get for it. We don't decide when the waters of our own rivers, the Punjab, five rivers, will reach our land. This is slavery. So in this Terra Viva manifesto, we went to the roots. You know, we, 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 we tried to understand what land and soil is in our every culture. And it was quite amazing. And I noticed my dear friend Maya Gobardhan is in the Zoom. Hello, Maya. She's the one who put together a Bhumi book on soil from across the cultures what the soil has meant. But both in, in the Abrahamic traditions in Hebrew, the word Adam, the first man, is derived from Adamus, which is the word for soil. And human was not always opposite to the land. We were not always anthropocentric. The word human is derived from the word humus, which is the Latin word for living soil. So these separations have been crafted. In fact, a very dear friend of mine, an ecologist who fought on the GMO question with me, so he was the uh, the chair of the International Society of Ecologists, he was doing a book on how Christianity was changed by the influence of money to make it more market friendly. And we are seeing that in every religion of the world. It's being made more market friendly and more nature unfriendly and more human unfriendly. So these mutations, you know, genetically engineered cultures, religions, organisms, minds, is the way colonization works. It genetically engineers what should evolve through interbeing. Um, clearly, all this is pretty unsustainable. If at root our spirituality and our connection with the land base, with soil, with each other, um, has been hijacked by something so devious as money, uh, the question would be what, what in, in, in this situation, how can sustainability, how can, how can that come about? But for that, I think we need to really look at the word sustainability itself. And both of you have, have talked at length about this. And I'm just going to um, say that Derek in his book, The Dreams, uh, writes, but of course, sustainable development, uh, that sustainable development is an oxymoron. Um, and so Derek, do you wanna say something about that? Now Derek's on mute. <laughs> So yeah, I think, I think for me, the word sustainable means that something can be done more or less into perpetuity. And when I think about sustainable, I think about the Talawa Indians who lived and live where I live now in far Northern California on the coast. And according to the myths of the Talawa, they lived here since the beginning of time. And according to the myths of science, they lived here for at least 12,500 years. And it doesn't really matter which to me because 12,500 years is long enough to be considered sustainable, I would say. And they did so when the first Europeans arrived in about 200 years ago, a little under 200 years ago. I mean, the place was a paradise. And the Klamath River, which is just down that way a little ways, 
was even as late as the 1930s. It's the, it's the second biggest river in the United States on the West Coast, I, I believe, after the Columbia. It's a pretty big river. And the point is that even as late as the 1930s, people said that the Columbia was, quote, black and roiling with salmon. And uh, a couple years ago, the Klamath Indians had to uh, basically cancel a lot of their salmon festival because there weren't enough fish. And the point is that the Klamath, the Yurok, the Talawa lived here for a long time sustainably. And we can talk about the characteristics of sustainable cultures beyond what we've already talked about. But the point is that humans can live sustainably and can make land use decisions sustainably. And a little sideline here, maybe this is the main point, is that Ray Raphael talked about how it, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, Indians affected the land base too. And I've actually seen eco philosophers whom I don't really like talking about how um, because indigenous people affect the land where they live, therefore it's okay for Boise Cascade to deforest. And therefore it's okay for there to be oil exploration in the Amazon basin or whatever. And Ray Raphael really cut through all that when he commented that the Indians of this region would make land use decisions based on the notion that they were going to be living there for the next 500 years. And if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years, you make different land use decisions. And so again, for me, sustainable means that it is something that can be done. And here's another thing that's really important is that we've been told that evolution is based on survival of the fittest by which it's commonly meant. And I'm not blaming Darwin for this, by the way. Anyway, survival of the fittest is commonly understood. It's been, as Vandana was saying, sort of co-opted into being survival of the most exploitative, survival of the most essentially sociopathic or capitalist. And I would argue that it's not survival of the fittest, but it's survival of the fit, which is how well you fit into the land base. And survival, those creatures who survive in the long run, survive in the long run. And the way you survive in the long run is not by harming your land base. The way you survive in the long run is by improving the land on its own terms. And so how do we think that the world got to be so wild and fecund in the first place? How do we think that the world got to be so full of life and the river so full of salmon? It happened by every creature living and dying and making the world a better place by its birth and by its death and by everything about it. Salmon make forests healthier by living in them and by dying in them. And likewise, and this is not woo-woo, this is, they found that forests near uh, salmon-bearing streams in, in streams that, that, in regions that evolved with the salmon, um, the, the trees will grow 70% faster, 70% faster if the salmon are present. And when the salmon are not present, they grow that much slower. Um, and it's not just salmon, it's oyster mushrooms, it's the redwood trees, it's the cedar trees, it's how they all are working together. And so the way you live sustainably is by making sure that the soil is healthier because you're there, is by making sure that the forest is healthier because you're there or the desert or wherever it is, the, the biome that, that you happen to be in. And so that's what sustainable is. And then development 
the reason I said sustainable development is an oxymoron is because the word development has been turned into a toxic mimic. It's been turned into, it's a piece of propaganda that what development really means, if you look it up in the dictionary, is it means that something becomes more fully itself. It becomes better. It becomes, well, so, so it becomes, here's a, yeah, it's better with examples, that a caterpillar develops into a butterfly. A child develops into an adult. That's, a, that's a, an inevitable process and a process of fulfillment. It becomes more fulfilled. But a meadow does not develop into white box houses. And a river does not develop into a reservoir with uh, dams on it and with the uh, Mekong catfish no longer able to swim to, to their homes. And so development has been perverted into meaning industrialization. And what we really mean is, is sustainable industrialization is an oxymoron. I can go on about that later, but I think that's enough for now. Okay. Um, there's a question from Pandu Hegde. Vandana, you know Pandu, right? Yeah, Apiko. We've been together in Chicago. Yeah. And <laughs> <Sheetze. laughs> so, Pandu, would you like to ask your question? And Leo, can Pandu be unmuted? Pandu, are you there? Where's Leo? <laughs> uh, Prabha, while we are waiting for Pandu to come, let me just uh, supplement uh, what Derek has said. So, you know, to sustain means support, yeah? And among the hundreds of words we have for the earth, one is dharti, dharitri, the one who hamko dharti hai, hamko, you know, she supports us. The land is our support. And Maya and I do an annual um, earth festival called Bhumi. We don't know if it'll be able, we'll be able to do it on the day it's always done, 1st of October with the India International Center. But we'll do it in any case, whenever this lockdown um, is removed, which has nothing to do with the medical issue. It has everything to do with Bill Gates project of putting su su surveillance systems in place is complete. Um, Development, as my dear friend Brian Goodwin, a brilliant biologist, a development biologist, always wrote, he said, development is exactly, you know, a self-organized evolution from within, including emergence of new properties. The seed doesn't look like the plant that it grows into, but it's built into the seed to develop into that plant. It was in the nine, I think, 48 or 49, the word development was hijacked by the World Bank. And those who wanted to recolonize us again through debt. And now they make development a deficiency, yeah? That we were deficient. And having worked on all of this for decades, you know what the earlier development projects used to be? India needs development because we don't have pesticides. They need to put money for polluting us with poisons that kill the insects, the bees and all, and give us cancer. Um, there's a cancer train that goes from Punjab to Matinda now because they thought we weren't developed because we had ecological ways of controlling pests. Um, we have the neem, we had hundreds of plants, but we don't even need plants. When you have diversity of plants and then you have diversity of insects, they have all the amazing systems amongst themselves to regulate without violence the population so that no insect becomes a pest. Um, Wolfgang Sachs and Ivan Illich and a team of us wrote a development dictionary. I think it must have been in the 90s, I would imagine. Um, and I would suggest look for it. It's available. Uh, it was published by Zen. But in the development dictionary, we go through, again, the genetic engineering of all the vocabulary of development. And I was asked to write the chapter on resources and nature. The word resource, which now means raw material, because of industrialism, 
used to mean that which renews itself on its own. So bija, the seed to which I've dedicated my life, bija means that from which life arises on its own forever and ever and ever without an external input. Now they want to make seed dependent on external control. And we stop the terminator seed, which would have been a seed which could not germinate without Monsanto giving the chemicals to trigger its ability to create the plant, but the seed would be sterile. So we are living, you know, when you talk about the war, for me, the war is very simple. A war against life because life renews on its own. And how on earth can you extract when a seed becomes seed? When a child grows in freedom in an indigenous culture. So you have to create dependency. You have to create extractivism. And then in the extraction, you have to define deficiency unimproved seed, primitive seed, primitive tribes, primitive people, and now primitive human beings. If I was to share with you the amazing language, let me just share this with you. The amazing language, here is the brain uh, of Silicon Valley talking about us being deficient, yeah? What's the difference between a human who has upgraded her body and brain? using machines. We don't have brains and we don't have self-organized brilliant bodies. And worse, just yesterday, I saw this thing. This is where they want to make money. Food shouldn't grow from seed and soil and the land. Food should come from a fake impossible burger with 14 patents, 14 patents to this, Genetically engineered soya, genetically engineered yeast, genetically engineered everything in a hugely complicated machine of anti-food because this is going to totally harm our gut microbiome. But this is so important about our future, let me just share this. Impossible food should really be called impossible patents. It's not food, it's software, intellectual property, 14 patents. In fact, in each bite of impossible food, burger, um, it's burger with additionally, uh, an additional 100 patterns for animal proxies for chicken and fish. And that's why they repeatedly say, so vegans think they're saving life by joining this, but this is a recipe for extinction of life. If you don't care for the animal, there won't be an animal. If you won't care for the fish and you've got a fake fish burger, you won't care for the fish. This is likely the, uh, the appeal of Bill Gates, the biggest, he's the Uber funder of Impossible. So if you thought Gates is Microsoft, forget it, he's your food. He's going to bring you your food. And it's a food operating system, a predecessor perhaps to a merger with Microsoft, MS Food. The business model is already etched in Silicon Valley. Licensed core technology, the protein synthesis, Forget that pulses give you good protein, that a respectful relationship among indigenous tribal cultures who worship the salmon before eating it, who worship the animals, and they take permission from the animals, that animals will tell them which one to hunt. Yeah? Um, protein synthesis, while seeking vertical integration of supply chain, which in this case is not from the coders, to the users, but from genetic engineers to protein seekers. This is the future we want. We are our food. It, uh, they call impossible burger, Bad Brown calls food an unimproved technology rather than the perfect technology of the relationship between the soil, the seed, the pollinators, our love, our care, our gut microbiome. Food is the currency of life. Maya and I again have done a book called Annam, which shows this continuity of food through biodiversity. That's why we treat food as sacred. This is the ultimate desacralization. And basically saying, get rid of the earth. Thank you, Vandana. Um, we, Leo and I would like to invite um, Dunu to comment or to place a question to either of you. Dunu Roy is a great friend of ours, um, Derek, for Vandana and myself, and uh, very much a leader in, 
in um, resistance, I would say, and in critiquing the current power structures. Dunu? Can, we un can Dunu be unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, hi. Thanks for inviting me into this very engrossing discussion. Vandana, of course, I've heard many times before. She's a usual fiery bit, full of packaged information and really engrossing. Derek, the first time I'm hearing him, but uh, there are lots of kind of concerns that I think are coming through. And two concerns, if I may highlight, and which perhaps both of them would like to respond to in due course of time. The first concern is that when we analyze the present, uh, we look at it in terms of the problems it is created. And uh, therefore, there's a kind of structured way of looking at the present itself, that one looks at what is going wrong and therefore, how can it be corrected? And in that, I think we also tend to be very selective. Uh, let me take this word development. Uh, well, yes, development is unfolding from the caterpillar to the butterfly. But in the same sense, development is also the unfolding of the butterfly into a dead insect. So one must remember that perhaps there are these two parts of growth or development. One is uh, growing up and the other is equally growing down. Uh, we tend to be very selective. We don't look at dying. We only look at living. And that is what growth seems to mean. So this kind of selective uh, notion of the present, does it give us a fully integrated view of the present itself? Uh, that's one question or one concern that I have. The second concern that I have is that when one seeks to work one's way out of this present, uh, what is it that we would like to move towards in the future? Very often the, the references to the past, that this is how the indigenes used to live. This is how uh, they continue to live in certain pockets. This is where resistance is building up in areas that are cut off somewhat from this mainstream of development. Uh, and that is my concern, that by looking at the past or what was there, what continues to survive, are we missing out on the present itself? That within the present, there are things happening. And, uh, I'll be looking at those for clues. I hear a lot about this, you know, what the tribal elders say, uh, which is very nice, sounds very good, but one must remember the tribals are fighting a losing battle. So where are those who are fighting some kind of a winning battle? And what do those elders, who we may not even recognize as elders, have to say? And uh, can we also bring them into the frame? I have not, for instance, heard anything about a slum leader saying something uh, or uh, somebody at the workers gate saying something. Why not? They're very much part of the present. Why don't we get their views? In? So those are the two concerns that I brought here yeah, and I'd very much like to hear what Bandana and Derek have to say about that. Yeah. Thank you, Dunu. Um, Derek, would you like to go with that? Sure, unless Vandana would like to go first. No, you go first, I'll come later. Okay. Um, I think that when I talk about the relationship between salmon and forests, I am not talking about a mythical past or even a past. I am talking about 
a process. Oh, first off, I want to say, I completely agree with you about the butterfly eventually developing into food for a lizard or for the soil. And that I want to thank you for reminding us that death is either the or a driver of natural communities and the the, the, the forest needs for salmon to die and that falcons need for mice to die and earthworms need for falcons to die and that is something we should never ever for one moment forget. So I want to thank you for that. And then I think it's important to, unless I, I it's very possible that I'm misunderstanding your questions. And if so, then I apologize. Um, but I think it's really important to recognize that where I live, the forests have developed, evolved over millions of years to have these intimate relationships. And I don't think, I, I, again, I could be misunderstanding, but I don't think that to talk about the forests as to talk about a condition that the forests were in prior to the beginnings, prior to the arrival of this culture's war on nature. I don't think that that's looking at the past. I think that's looking at what works and looking at what, I, I think it is the first step toward asking what it is that the forest and the river wants. And the first answer to what the forest and river wants is always, for me, the relationship it had prior to the beginnings of the assault. And in some cases, that relationship has changed forever. For example, passenger pigeons were a driver of the forests on the east coast of the United States, and they're gone. And someone else has to take their place. But the salmon are still here. And even if the salmon were gone, like the passenger pigeons, we still have to look at what the forest wanted to find out not to find out because the truth is that if we stop the assaults on the forests, on the grasslands, the forests and the grasslands will tell us what they want. And that's the wonderful thing. The, the image that keeps coming to my head about environmentalists everywhere is that we are like doctors and nurses in an emergency room and we are desperately putting bandages on the patient who is bleeding out and we're doing everything we can except we're not stopping the madman who is continuing to stab the patient. And so I think to look at this another way, in order to understand how to heal or how to help a body to heal, we also have to know what the body's shape is before it was shot, before it was stabbed. So that's part of my answer. And then, and then so far as the, um, why are there not workers in this particular conversation? I think, of course, workers are, are important, but from my perspective, one of the most 
devalued groups on the planet, one of the most devalued entities, communities is the natural world. And part of my role, there are, there are those who, who speak as best they can for workers. And I respect and admire that. And I have written the culture make believe I wrote about that. I've written about it elsewhere, but my primary, my primary role is to attempt to help us accept that the living planet has a voice and for us individually and communally to learn not only that it has a voice, but to learn to listen to what it is saying. And that's my role. And I respect the fact that other people have different roles. And I could be misunderstanding your questions completely. And if so, I apologize. Vandana? Yeah. So, you know, we, we can think of time as this linear, you know, past, present, and future, which is how linear time has been constructed through the mechanical mind. Uh, but, you know, Einstein taught us that space and time are a continuum. Um, that's the general theory of relativity. relativity. Um, but in Indian philosophy, we never talk of time alone. We always talk desh or kal. Desh kal is one. And it is process. It is a system of interactions. And that's why I always prefer, rather than say, this is the past and this is the future, this is modern and this is backward, uh, because all those are constructed categories, but what we can live through, experience, perceive, understand the patterns of our systems of relationships. And those systems of relationships uh, are very complex, but when they get too brutal, as in our time, it is fascinating that... Uh, you know, my friend Prasanna, the amazing theater person who's just written two plays in the middle of the lockdown. Uh, and last year we launched, uh, uh, you know, on the 150th anniversary of uh, Gandhi's birth, we launched a whole Satyagraha for a sacred economy, a fight for defending the sacred economy. And, um, and Prasanna uses the word monster, which is the word in Hindi for Daitya, yeah, the Rakshas. And it's not an accident that epics were always written about the contest between the deity shaktis of disruption, destruction, wiping out life, and the devi shaktis of renewal, of support, of recognition, that there is no being too small. Every being has a, a, a role. So we have a monster economy and and right now, the you know, I mean, the COVID, the COVID is an amazingly con confusing time because while everyone's been con con confused just yesterday, my sister Mira sent me, everyone who's talking about this is every expert, every expert around the world. Look at John Hopkins, you could look at all funded by one man, Bill Gates. One man has created the echo chamber of what is this? this crisis, but more than that, decided what the future economy will look like. And the slums, you know, these non viable systems. Don't know, I think we, we should really think deeply about the fact that how is it that at this time, first they pulled all the farmers off the land and threw them into slums and cities. And now they say, we've had enough of you. Just thrown away, thrown away half of India. And they keep talking about a new economy where people won't be needed because it will be digital. And this is a moment rather than uh, us looking at the past, what were the specializations we created for ourselves? Some working for the city, some working for the country, some working for food, some working for health. It's absolutely important to see what are the major attacks on life, including human life, including human rights, including human livelihoods. If we are faced with a system 
which says you won't have work, then our resistance is to create work, you know, and to create new solidarities between the city and the country. If the new war is saying no food, lab food, impossible burger, our resistance is to say it doesn't matter what it'll take, we're going to defend real food. And I have never seen this as the artificial divide between either nature and people because we are walking nature, you know? If we didn't have our gut microbiome, 60 trillion cells, we didn't have the virome, 380 trillion, trillion viruses, we wouldn't be here alive as human beings. And Bill Gates has decided now, if Hitler created a war against inferior races, those chemicals he used to kill people at that time were turned into the war against insects, against plants, the pesticides, the herbicides, so all of that war that has pushed 90% of biodiversity to extinction. We are now witnessing a declaration of war against people and all of the earth species. Most of humanity is being, in, in this world view of the tech giants, people aren't needed. The poor definitely, the workers are needed. The poor are needed. The poor are occupying real estate in the Harabi. How do we get rid of them? How come they were just flushed out of the Harabi? How come all of the workers were suddenly redundant and you're already talking about unviable economies, future economies? That is the struggle we need right now. A contest about the future we will see today in order to have solidarity for all life, non-human and human and all humans, divided in all kinds of ways by different kinds of divide and rule policy. Thank you, Vandana. Um, is it the fact that both of you started out as physicists that you both think like this? <laughs> well, you know, the thing with physics, at least my kind of physics, you're taught process. You're taught to think about what will happen over time. You know, in quantum theory, what happens in integrated ways, non-separable. But even in classical mechanics, you know, where does the projectile go? Whereas everything else is absolutely, you know, those other disciplines have become very fixed. And process is what is missing right now, including in our thinking about our futures. What is the process? What is the small thing we do today? that if replicated enough, because it has a life of its own, can become like the spinning wheel multiplying, like the seed multiplying, like ecological farms and autonomous sovereign food communities multiplying, creative new work, old work. I think old work has to be brought back. I think the spinning wheel was brilliant. Gandhi said, you call it primitive, you threw it away. I'm going to dig it out and get freedom. Seeds, our seeds were called primitive. I said, no, we're going to save primitive seeds. Today, if we have health because we have primitive seeds, if we have freedom, it's because we have primitive seeds. I think if, if we recognize the modern and uh, the backward or the primitive and the civilizing and civilization are all constructs of colonization, then what we should look for is life and its interrelationships and the sustaining power of those relationships. That's all we should see and not say, okay, but this is not enough. We should always see, oh, but someone else is taking care of that. And that is the beauty of understanding relationship. That there's always another being looking after some, because I am limited in my biological and physical being. I might be unlimited in my interactions and consciousness, but I do have limits of how much this one body and this being can do. Um, the reason I ask that about both of you being physicists or starting out as physicists is that you must know lots about mechanics and there's a question on what are the key levers and key shifts necessary to subvert the systemic power structure. This is from Vipul Shaha. What role can an individual and groups play apart from reduced conscious consumption and growing your own food? So here's a question on lever points. And Derek, would you like to take that? Um, sure. I, I, I have a few things. One of them is that uh, I want to go back to the to the physics question, and um, I didn't 
honestly really enjoy getting my degree in physics very much. Um, partly because the school I went to, they made us work really, really hard. And it was, um, it was hard, but what they did is they taught us two things. One is they taught us a work ethic and the other is they taught us I remember one class with a professor that I especially disliked. It was optics and optics lab. And one of the things that he would do is what he called eye brain exercises, which is when we looked at a machine, and this wouldn't work for electronics for obvious reasons, but when we looked at some machine in the laboratory, he would have us look at it for like 10 minutes with our hands behind our backs. And then he would say, if you twist this lever, or if you twist this screw, what happens? And you had to be able to follow through in your mind how that would affect the other parts of the machinery. And there is a certain, it taught us not to believe in magical thinking. And it taught us to believe, this is one problem I have with a lot of the technological mindset is that somehow those who are promoting the quote renewable end quote future, they think that you can put in a dam without consequences. And they think that you can, they think that solar photovoltaics grow on the solar tree and are capable of being harvested or something or maybe the magical bright green fairies deliver them in the middle of the night. But they don't understand that there are physical and social consequences of all of those. And getting that degree taught me a certain rigor. And here's a really, really short and kind of fun example. But I was being interviewed by this guy several years ago who believed it was possible to have an industrial economic system with no exploitation of anybody at all. And he believed it was possible to have cities without any exploitation, but only purely voluntary economic exchanges. I said, okay, great. How do you get around in your city? And he said, buses. I said, great. What are your buses made of? He said, metal. I said, great, where do you get your metal? He said, from mines. I said, great, how do you get people to work in the mines? He said, well, you just pay them a lot. And I said, well, mining is one of the first forms of slavery and it's a really difficult life, but I'll give that one to you. What do you do about the fact that every mine, every hard rock mine in the world has polluted groundwater and rivers? He said, well, so I said, what do you do about the people who live next to the river? He said, you pay them to move. I said, what if they won't move? He said, well, you pay them more. I said, what if they have lived there for 5,000 years and their ancestors are buried there and they won't move? And he said, well, how many are there? I said, 500. And he said, um, well, the million people in the city vote and they vote that those 500 people have to be evicted. I said, great. So what you've done is you've moved from purely voluntary exchanges <laughs> to democratic empire, land theft from indigenous people, and genocide all within less than a minute, also you can have a bus. And the point is that he hadn't thought through the processes of what it requires to have a bus. And that's what I want people to do. One of the things I want people to do is to think through where things come from and what are the consequences, both ecological and social, of those material items. So that's one of the things I was taught. So there was that, I wanted to address that. And then um, levers, levers. I think, I love the fact that both you, Supi, and you, Vandana, have been talking about a war on nature. And in another lifetime, I would have been a historian because I love reading history. 
And I've read so much military history in my life. And one of the questions is, how do you win a war? And one of the ways, one of the primary ways that wars are won is by destroying the enemy's capacity to wage war. And that can be done through various violent or nonviolent means. The point is, I think the first step toward stopping the war on nature is to A, acknowledge that there has, that there is one. So thank you so much for framing this whole discussion in terms of that. And second, it's to start thinking like a serious resistance and also to make your loyalty clear to yourself. And then one of the ways I think about this and, and, and something that, that I think is really important for people to think about is if space aliens had come down from outer space and they were changing the climate and they were giving us computers and hot showers in exchange for, you know, there, what, what is it? In the last 40 years, there's 50% of wildlife has, has been disappeared. If they were, I'm going to stop and go a different direction for a second. And I think that if you were to talk to somebody who was alive 5,000 years ago, and you were to point out the things that this culture has accomplished. And if you were to say, one of these didn't happen, either they were able to put a, a human on the moon or they were able to essentially kill the oceans, I think the person would more likely believe that they were able to put a person on the moon than to kill the oceans, which is in the process of happening. And so if, if aliens were doing all this, I think we would have many, we, we would be thinking more along the lines of a serious resistance of how do we, how do we destroy the enemy's capacity to wage war on the planet and on the poor and on humans the world over. And I think I think that's for me the first step toward serious resistance is 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 understanding all of those and then if you want we can come back and talk about specific levers but but I think the first step is recognizing the importance of finding the levers and of and I want to say one more thing which is you said you part of your question was um, what can we do individually and communally? And I love the answer of Kathleen Dean Moore when she's asked, what can one person do? And she always answers, don't be one person, by which she means organize and organize and organize and work within communities. So I'm going to leave the hard part of actually naming the levers to Vandana. Okay. <laughs> you got the easy part, Vandana. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Archimedes told us, give me an inch to stand on and I can turn the whole world. So the understanding of what are our strengths and, I, you know, part of those divisions, those crazy divisions of humans and nature as separate, I call it eco apartheid and humans as superior to other beings, anthropocentrism, but you don't create that construct without making some humans superior to other humans. And what we are seeing on the streets of Minneapolis today is that illusion of superiority playing out in violence. Um, and that's centuries and centuries of, of the treatment of someone with a different pigmentation, richer pigmentation actually, more pigmentation, more color should be richer if you just think in terms of pigmentation as richness. Um, uh, so what are the vulnerabilities of the system being put in place? In the past, well, it was, first it was colonialism and Gandhi pulled out the lever. He said, Swaraj, self-govern, self-rule, make your own things and do the satyagraha. Refuse to cooperate. 
refuse a no from your deepest, con deepest conscience. So for me, Swaraj, your Desi, Swadeshi, make your own things. We've been reduced to be consumers. We've got to become makers. But ultimately, Satyanvay will not cooperate. After colonialism, for five decades, we had development. And then they wanted it all on fast forward and they gave it a new name, go globalization. And in 30 years, they've devastated the world, created the billionaires, five guys running the world, telling us what to do, telling us what our bodies are, mining our bodies and brains for their future capitalism of surveillance. Um, but the ultimate sin, as Gandhi called it, you know, work, wealth without work, no work, just mine and degrade the human being like you let ruins of the mines of coal, of uranium, of all the other heavy metal mines and rare metals mine. This mining of the human being will be the ruination of our being alive in, a, uh, in fullness of life with other life. It's interesting, you know, it's not that we didn't have technology before, but even the Green Revolution was not introduced on the justification of technology. It was introduced on the justification of feeding the world. They needed another narrative. It's the Gates and the Zuckerbergs who have created a vocabulary of technology without description. A technology for what? With what ecological footprint? With what social footprint? So a tool has been elevated to be the new civilizing mission of digital dictatorship as the new civilization. And in terms of colonies, if it was land and territories in the old colonialism, it is the land and territory of our being. We are ultimately, we are the ultimate mind. We are the new raw material. And how then do you, Make a shift, have a liver. Your, your sovereignty is your liver. Of course, there'll be costs. But when a system is designed to control and imprison, saying no, that's costs. But if you know who you are and you know how you are related to a sacred universe, all the costs they can take from you are superficial costs, actually. As Gandhi said, at best they can take my body, but they'll never take my soul. This will always be independent of the slave system. Um, and in terms of shift, you know, when people say, how long will it take? Oh, da, 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 da. The paradigm shift is a second. You just have to get rid of the illusions. In a second, you can make the shift. And all it means is getting rid of all the propaganda, the nonsense of colonialism, of, the de of development hijacked from life and biology into economic colonization. And now, technology as the new religion, rather than technology as a tool, as something we use with choice. Tools have to be governed through democracy. They have to be governed through assessment. We used to have offices of technology assessment in the United Nations. All that has been changed. And if technology is the new religion of and the new civilizing mission to destroy this world, to destroy people's lives, just think of the numbers. ILO has told us 1.9 billion people will lose their livelihoods of the 3.3 million and is being treated as an inevitability permanent, not just passing. World Food Program, 130 million people are dying, going to die of starvation, 300,000 per day. And no one is bothering about these much bigger numbers because the new economy based on the new religion of technology has to be institutionalized. And sadly, Governments we will, which we elected to power have become petty errand boys for the tech empires. This death of democracy is what we all should be rising against. Wow, that's a lot for me to get my ha head around. It's um, raising this question of um, omnicidal nature of things. That there is something at work now that is completely destructive. It is so destructive that it will destroy itself in the end. Um, 
Derek, would you like to talk about that? And I just want to say that a uh, little bit that I'm, ref I'm referring to a question here asked by Ashwin Lobo, who's um, someone I know and have lived with for a few months, um, who says that I agree that Bill Gates and the people running Monsanto are doing horrible things, but aren't they living sacred beings just like us? These people are destroying life. We're trying to protect it. What makes the destroyers and defenders so different? Has the sanctity of the destroyers been tainted somehow, or are they behaving in a way which is natural to them? So he would like to hear you both on that. And um, Derek? Well, I would like to thank everybody for the excellent questions so far. This is great. Um, and next, I want to add, say one more thing about the last question too, which is when one of the things that guides my thinking on how to resist is I often ask if blue whales could take on human manifestation, what would they do? Or if coho salmon or delta smelt or Mekong delta catfish could, could take on human manifestation, what would they do? And we can ask the same. I interviewed a member of the Tupac Amaristas back in the 90s. And he pointed out to me that I had, on a global level, tremendous privilege in that I was literate. And I had the uh, financial wherewithal to be able to spend time writing. And there are people in the world who, who don't, human beings who in the world who, who don't have that luxury. And it became clear to me that it is part of my responsibility to use my privilege to undercut its basis. And anyway, so I wanted to, to say that. And then the next, the next part of this is that, I guess there's two things I wanna say. Um, one is that Chris Hedges and I have had some interesting conversations about our, the lessons that each of us have learned from being in the midst of violence him through being a war correspondent and me through uh, my father's violence when I was a child. And one of the things that Chris learned, and we've, we've had very productive discussions about this, one of the things that he learned is that violence is very painful to the survivors as well. And he has said, I've lost too many friends in war to to, to want to, to, to visit that upon anyone. And I have tremendous respect for that. And one of the lessons that I've learned is that perpetrators, some perpetrators at least of abuse are insatiable and there is no limit. There is no amount of appeasement that will stop them. And in terms of this culture, there is no limit to its attempt to control. It will not stop until it is stopped, either by us or by someone else, some other member of nature, or by ecological collapse or economic collapse or however. It, 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 it won't stop voluntarily. And then the, the next thing I want to bring to this is that years ago, I interviewed Robert J. Lifton, who is probably the world's foremost authority on the psychology of genocide. And one of the brilliant things that he observed is that before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to convince yourself and others that what you are doing is not an atrocity, but instead, beneficial. You have to have what he called a claim to virtue. So from their own perspective, the Nazis weren't committing mass murder and genocide. They were purifying the Aryan race. They were doing this good thing according to their own perspective. And um, the 
in the United States, they weren't committing land theft and genocide, they were manifesting their destiny. And the British weren't doing a bad thing, they were carrying the white man's burden. And I'm not saying this is true, I'm saying, well, heck, even from my own perspective, we know this on a personal level, I can't speak for any of you, but I've never once in my life been a jerk. Um, every time I have objectively been a jerk, I've had it fully rationalized. You know, we, we act, we, we, we try to convince ourselves that we're doing a good thing even when we're doing a bad thing. Those in power aren't going, ha, it's great to kill the world. They're developing natural resources. They are, tech, they're, they're following their religion. They're thinking this is a good thing. So that's another thing I, I want to bring into this picture. And then another part is, yes, there are very few people who, who have very strong levers of power in the world. That is true. And in addition, I think that we have to recognize that certain social systems and certain technologies lead to certain behaviors such that if you want to have, I mentioned earlier that if you have a reliance on, Lewis Mumford wrote a brilliant essay that I would beg everyone to read called either authoritarian and democratic techniques or democratic and authoritarian techniques. Very short essay, maybe 12 pages. And in there he talked about how certain technologies are, de are, are democratic and lead, lead to democratic social systems and certain technologies lead to authoritarian power systems. It's not possible to have democratically controlled terminator seeds. That is an authoritarian technique that arises from and gives rise to authoritarian systems. And so Bill Gates is a creation of that system. This is not in any way to lessen his personal responsibility. It's to say that if Bill Gates were not there, there would be another who would be like that who would be controlling the, the system or who would, be, who would be in that relationship. Um, and there, there's another part of the authoritarian techniques, which is not only do they lead to authoritarian power structures, but he called them authoritarian techniques because the technology itself becomes in charge such that I can't speak for India, but in the United States, cities are designed for cars. Cars actually control the design of cities. They're in charge. Or we think we talk about this. It's so interesting to me that we say, gosh, it's so hard. What are we going to do about global warming? But all the solutions to global warming, what they all have in common is they take industrial capitalism as the given and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism. And the question is who's in charge? And if we were really to, we collectively as an entire species were to recognize that fossil fuels are part of what's killing the planet, you would think that if they weren't in charge, we would, we would just turn them off. Um, so that's another part. And then so far as the existential question of whether they um, I think, I mean, certainly they're part of life because they're li alive, but there's also a pragmatism that I think if someone were to physically, personally be murdering those 
I love, I would stop them. And that is irrespective of the fact that they are living beings with a life and history of their own. I think that however it's done, an easy example, Ted Bundy needed to be stopped. And, and I bring all this up in terms of if we, were, if, if we were to stop Ted Bundy, we also, I bring up the bit about Robert J. Lifton and the claims to virtue in part because on one level, motivations don't matter to me. What matters to me is physical reality. And I don't care if someone has themselves convinced they're doing the right thing. And I don't care if I have myself convinced I'm doing the right thing. What matters to me is what happens. And on one level, and on another level, we always have to take into account Part of the reason I'm just yammering about all this is because, yes, there are individuals who have a lot of power, but I think what is most important to me is the system that, that grants them that amount of power. And for me, it is that system itself which must be destroyed. I'm done yammering. Wow. Thank you, Derek. Vandana, do you want to? Yeah. Oh, you know, I basically think in the last 500 years, really, of colonialism, there's been a very calculated separation of the responsibility of those who do the harm. You know? And that is through creating these constructs. This is why I wrote my book, Oneness Versus the One Percent. You know, shattering illusions. The very idea of limited liability corporation was we will have limited liability. And the gold and the spices and the textiles will come, it'll be all ours. But if the Dutch steal our pirate ship or the French and we have a conflict, and if nothing comes home, then society will bear the burden. So the socialization of costs and privatization of profits is, was built into the very invention of the word corporation. But it used to be limited liability. What I've witnessed in the last five years is zero liability corporation. And it's not an accident that the, suddenly the word zero budget became fashionable in the world. Gates used it for destroying the education system or having the idea he would, you know. Then why, why do we have to waste money on teachers and schools? Let every kid sit in front of a computer, more efficient, and then have, have spy where on them to monitor if they're paying attention. Um, this zero liability system means that I do something, but the construct through which I operate in the world is immune from any action. And I have investigated, Bill Gates is spending his billions to totally take control, run this tragedy in which I don't know how many people are going to die. But he can't be held personally liable because the Gates Foundation can't be taken to court. They worked out a system of escaping from the normal consequences of wrong action that ordinary citizens have to go through. And then this new, you, may, you call it the, the virtue, I call it the civilizing mission of turning your tools of control and mastery and slavery into this mysterious new religion of the civilizing mission. Well, you work in such an effective way that people get seduced into it. A lot of people are going to take all this monitoring of our blood functions, our brain functions, some of it because of the fear created for, with all the surveillance mechanisms and tracing. But I always say, if it's about tracing of a particular infection and a particular disease epidemic, then there should be a timeline, you know? These things have graphs, they go up, come down. When will it end? And when will this tracing 
we put aside, as the Spanish case showed, the right to be forgotten. When will you erase this data? But this data to be made permanent to siphon off, a lot of people will volunteer into it. Not only because you're climbing in that civilizing mission of having the next tech gadget. And so I increasingly think the place, the fertile ground for resistance is the communities who have been made expendable in this experiment for the new empire. And that's where our new solidarities and new creativities should come. Not blocked by old divisions, but allow an emergence of a new politics of solidarity, cooperation, co-creation. And uh, we don't know where it will take us, but we, we do know what are the things that kill people. Direct ones, like the death of the person in Minneapolis, all the women, victims of femicide, all the people who are dying on their way home right now, that's totally direct violence. But we can also predict and say, if this doesn't happen, I would say, for those of, on, on this, um, in this conversation, I think the right to food movement needs to start organizing to make sure that this food link to patents and monopolies and siphoning off is, does not become the way those who've been pushed to hunger are fed. That our feeding programs should be healthy food that nourishes our living bodies. These are the issues we need to be organizing around right now. And as you said, We've been given privilege when I work with Chipko. I should say, okay, they know more than me, the women know much more than me, but I was given the capacity to make a graph and write in English. And these are colonial systems, but if we can flip them to create the resistance and enforce the strength of the resistance, suddenly we can use them as true tools, not as power, but in service of life. Can, can I know, Suprabha, when will we end? Yeah, so we, we are coming towards, uh, I think uh, we should start winding up. Aruna has something to say, and then we'll go, uh, I think we'll, Aruna, do you want to say, ask your question? Richard Suprabha. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll try and be as brief as I possibly can. This is Aruna Rodriguez speaking. Um, I think in this group and even beyond this group, we have a pretty good understanding of what has led to our crisis at the present. I think we're in a very dark place, a very dark tunnel. And we need to be able to come out of this tunnel and it's typified by two things. One is the virus that brings together a lot of background and history as to why we're here. And that virus story has not ended. And I think it will become darker to tell us what everybody has been saying, hinging and, and uh, focusing on our present predicament. That is an international issue. The Indian issue, and we can link in internationally in very many pathways, is what we have done to 190 lakh, and maybe more, I don't have the figure, migrants, and what that says about the Indian con consciousness. Also brings together everything that Vandana has been trying to say, and Derek has been trying to say. Now my problem, because I am, I need to see solutions as a person. I can't work where I can't see solutions. And it has dictated my work in whichever way, good, bad, or indifferent, but that's what I try to do. The number one problem is, I think, safe, nutritious food, and it links into just about everything. Bill Gates, genetic engineering, forests, all of it. And it links into the migrants. We've been throwing food at them at the railway stations. My request to everybody is because we've got a timeline 
on priorities that we need to address. If we let those timelines go, I think we've lost it. Whatever chances we have for climate change, agriculture, food is on a timeline. And so whether it's Satyagra, I would think that we should start with our own countries. It's a micro and a macro level connectivity that we need. We need to prioritize how are we going to succeed? What are the solutions we have as civil society? We have a major problem in India because all our institutions have crumbled. And so I'm putting this into everybody's lap, whether in this session or any other session that consumes me. This is the situation. Thank you, Aruna. Um, is this something you'd like to address both of you and we can consider this and maybe one more question. Uh, well, all I'll say is, you know, what Derek and I were talking about, about understanding process, both where do things come from? Because part of the heavy footedness of industrialism, and I'm preparing a whole new report on the heavy ecological footprint of the digital economy, because I had a debate with the FAO, where they use the word dematerialization, just because now you can do genomic reading. Of we are dematerializing the sea. I said, no, you never dematerialize. Just because you can do a digital map doesn't mean the real thing disappeared. It's still there and will be needed. It's just that you're shifting the control and ownership from those who actually save the seeds to those who can make the map, just as when the colonization happened, when the colonial said we came with a sword in one hand and a yardstick in the other. Map making has always been the way to chart out territories. So if we think of the heavy footprint, but we also think of where it's going, there will be things in which we, we do not have the capacity. There will be things in which we can make a difference. I think creating very large numbers of hungry people, small numbers of hungry people. You know, in India, we had a tradition a bell used to ring in the village to ask every family would say, anyone hungry, come and eat. And the family would only eat after the last hungry people in the village had uh, eaten. But that's when there were few hungry people. When you pushed half of your people to hunger, then we do need new imaginations, new systems. I think the only difference I would say is, uh, you know, for me, what's worked over 50 years, Aruna, is not having a guarantee of this is the successful solution, but just two things. One, this is my duty to do this within my limited capacities. And I cannot escape that duty. And number two, have deep trust in the power of nature and deep trust in the power of people. You do the right thing, offer it in service, solutions emerge. But when we begin to look for immediate solutions, what very often happens is we trip within old parents. And at this point, it really is an issue of, when, you know, will all people live in well-being and health? Or will we be in a world where there is 90% through and it doesn't matter how many good compassionate beings will be there, but the size will be so big that small communities will not be able to address this. And the second is even those who think they have succeeded to enter into the new empire will have lost their humanity because they will not have their freedom. So this is, it's really about life and freedom. And therefore to make the choices of life and freedom, we have to do it at whatever openings in our life are there. The lockdown is only partially a medical issue. The lockdown is really to lock down the economy that was to create an economy of the five tech giants. And this is where we need to be thinking, even while we are in lockdown, what is the world that we will shape? What are the, and I think discussions like this are important because they allow us to communicate. They allow us to allow a flow of thinking. But I think we are in too deep a crisis. Imagine tomorrow there'll be a solution what we can look for is this dead tunnel is going to be very dark. It's going to get worse. I'm going to reverse and walk free in the farm or the forest or wherever.
Thank you, Vandana. Derek? Um, again, I want to thank everyone for their extraordinary questions and Vandana for her extraordinary answers. And when I think about solutions, the first thing that always comes to mind for me is that before I look for solutions, I ask what are the framing conditions and what am I solving for? And a really good example of this is, you know, I've mentioned in passing sort of bright green technologies and the solutions to global warming, but they're not actually solving for stopping global warming. What they're solving for is they're asking, how can we stop global warming without affecting this way of life? And then they're, 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 they're getting no solutions because there are no real solutions and the solutions they present then are false. Or another way to say this is people will ask, gosh, how can we save the salmon? And when people say, how can we save the salmon? That's not really what they're asking. What they're asking is, how can we save the salmon without stopping industrial fishing, without taking out dams, without stopping industrial forestry, without stopping the murder of the oceans, and without stopping global warming? And the answer is you can't. If you wanna save salmon, the solutions are there. You need to remove dams, you need to stop industrial fishing, stop industrial logging, stop the murder of the oceans, stop global warming and whatever else I forgot to say. It's like, I just did an interview a few weeks ago that was really terrible. The interviewers kept asking me, how can we basically stop the murder of the planet? And I was saying, well, we need to stop industrial civilization. And they were saying, but we don't wanna give up. They literally said, I don't wanna give up golf courses. And I said, what do you want me to do? I can't, you can't have the industrial system. You can't consume a planet and live on it too. So I always think about what a doctor friend of mine says that correct diagnosis is the first step toward proper treatment. And so I think about when I ask, when we ask, how can we, first off, we have to ask, what do we want? And then we have to ask, how is it possible to get there? And then we ask, what are the framing conditions? Actually, I don't even think what we want is what's important. I think what's important is what does the land allow? And because, you know, I want to have, I don't know, it would be nice to have, I don't know what, it, I mean, I can think of all sorts of luxuries I want to have, tough luck. <laughs> it's like, that's that, and I'm not suggesting anything wrong with your question, which is fabulous. I'm thinking about how people approach it oftentimes is, it's like, well, I want to have this whole society and I want to have a planet too. It's like, the question of what do I want is the, is the, child, is the child's question. The real, I mean, if, let's say that I made my living by stealing from all my neighbors. And let's say that my neighbors say, hey, we don't like this. And I say, tough luck, this is what I want. I mean, that's the system we have. So anyway, so first off, solutions are based on the framing question. That's the first thing I wanna say. The next, I wanted to reiterate something that you said, Aruna, it was just brilliant. And you've said a million times, which is brilliant, Vandana, about the relationship between food and slavery. But in the United States, in the 1830s, there was an argument that I read or a discussion between a Southern pro-slavery philosopher and his Northern abolitionist buddy, who was also a capitalist. And the capitalist was saying, look, you should release all your slaves. And the, the, the Southerner was saying, we would gladly release our slaves if you could have, if you could present the right land ownership conditions because there are land ownership conditions in which it's in the capitalist's best interest to own slaves and land ownership conditions in which it's in the capitalist's best interest to not own them. And it's really simple. If there's a lot of land and not many people, the only way you can get people to work for you is at the point of a gun to enslave them. Because access to land means access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means access to self-sufficiency. On the other hand, if you can get a bunch of people 
and put them in a small piece of land, or you can pretend that those in power control all the land, if you can get them to believe that, then they don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means they have to go to work for you at whatever pittance you want to, to offer them, which means that they are, it's a much better deal for the capitalists if you don't actually have to own the people, but instead they have no means for self-sufficiency. And then I had a friend whose husband was from Bangladesh, and this is current time. This is not even very long ago. And he said that in his lifetime, when he was a teenager, um, that his mother would say, can you go get lunch? And he would walk down to the river and catch fish for lunch. And by the time he was in his 20s and 30s, the river was so polluted that actually to get fish, they had to get fish from Iceland. And if you, one more thing about that, which is the laws of apartheid were written explicitly because the people of South Africa were living in self-sufficient villages and they needed workers for their mines. So how are you going to get workers for the mines? You put in a hut tax, a poll tax. You force them into the wage economy by making them go into a cash economy. So somebody had to get a, get a job when the, previously they had not had to get jobs because they're living in their communities. So one more thing about this, which is if your experience, not in your head, but if your experience is that your food comes from the grocery store and your water comes from the tap, you will defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. If on the other hand, your food comes from the land and your water comes from the river, you will defend to the death those because your life depends on it. So one of the absolutely crucial things, I know that I'm saying things that you've said a million times, Vandana, but one of the absolutely crucial things that the system has had to do is to insert itself between us and the source of all life and to make us believe that the system is what brings us life, not the land. So I'm just saying one of the crucial things, I'm just agreeing with you and validating in a very, validating is the wrong word, but agreeing with you in a long-winded way that food is everything. Kropotkin talked about how so many revolutions have foundered because of bread, because in 60 days people starve to death and the revolution has to be able to feed the people because otherwise they're dead. And then the last thing I wanna say is that I wrote an essay 15 years ago called something like Beyond Hope. And it was about how I was sort of attacking hope in it, but, but people have misinterpreted the essay a lot. That what I was really trying to do with the essay is not slam hope at all, but I was slamming a very specific definition of hope. I, I defined hope very clearly that hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. And I was attempting to tease out what we do and don't have agency over. And so, like somebody came up to me one time and said, are you saying I can't hope that my brother survives his cancer? And I said, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is you can certainly hope your brother survives cancer, but what you can't do is stand there with car keys in your hand and say, gosh, I hope you make it to the hospital. So to go back to the salmon, if we say, gosh, I hope salmon survive, that is, and we don't do anything, that is an obscenity. If on the other hand, so I had this, 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 this person wrote to me and said, I, this very smart Anishinaabeg woman wrote to me and said, I wanna tease out this whole hope question. What is the role of prayer in our, in our resistance? And she and I went back and forth on it a few times. And what we came up with is if you pray that salmon survive and you don't take out the dams, you don't stop the industrial forestry, et cetera, then that is, that is a form of blasphemy. You are giving up your agency. And on the other hand, if we take out the dams and then we stop the industrial forestry, we stop the other problems, then we have to hope and we pray that the river will accept our offering. And we accept and we hope and we pray that the salmon will return. Once we have done everything in our power, then it's up to them.
That's it. Wow. So um, I don't know where Leo is. I think we should end on um, Derek's uh, point leads into Dunu's um, comment here. And then maybe Leo, would you like to wrap up after that? Superba, I must leave. Yeah. I can guarantee one minute or something, then I can stay, but otherwise I must leave. Yeah. Well, so, would you like to say something? Yeah, my request would be that we end with Vandana because she is, she is, because she's Vandana. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this issue of inner hope. Hope is something you cultivate not in the full because there is so much you don't do, so much, so many others do, you know? And there you can just have hope that your, your bit, your doable bit, creates amazing things. So I started to save seeds. It was my duty. I wasn't going to accept Monsanto owning the seed. I wasn't going to accept GMOs pushed on everyone. I knew saving seeds, the little bit I could do. But out of it grew diversity. Out of it grew the pollinator six times more than in the forest next door. And the water level started to come up. For me, that sowing of the seeds of hope with the trust that because we are part of a very complex, very beautiful, very fertile, very abundant, very generous earth, that our work is to find out what is it we can do for society, for community. And then processes in society and community take over. We don't have to carry the baggage of mastery. We don't have to carry the baggage of um, Atlas, you know, Atlas carries the world on the shoulder. We just have to remember the earth carries us. And our work is to do no harm and to come in the way of violence. That's the Satyagraha. With love to all of you. Wow, Mandana. <laughs> so are you leaving us? I have to, I have to. I mean, I have some people waiting. My family is waiting. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> much love to you, Vandana. Hope she's gone. <laughs> Leo. Uh, yeah, I just felt that, uh, you know, the conversation was so engrossing that the best thing was to sit and absorb. And I'm immensely grateful for the richness of the conversation. I, instead of me asking, I have a couple of questions, but... Uh, I can always ask later, but I just saw that there were questions right on top, which I think helps uh, us in a nice way to contextualize all that is being said. One was by uh, somebody called uh, Yor. I don't know if Yor is around, but let me read out the question. Uh, so when asking the land a question, how do we know we have listened to the answer correctly? And there's the rest of the question also. But. So Derek, how do you feel about this question? I think uh, Derek, you have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry unmute. about that. Um, I think it's a hugely important question, and there is always the possibility of projection. And I think about, I think sometimes about a conversation with my mom I had one time where I was at her house and I was doing laundry and then folding my towels. And my mom walked up to me and said, would you like some help folding towels? And that's what she said. And what I heard her say, which she didn't say, was you're doing it wrong. And so the conversation actually went, she said, would you like some help folding towels? I said, no. And she said, okay, and walked away. And my point is that even when you have two people who speak the same language and who know each other very well and love each other, it is still always possible to misunderstand and to have confusion. And, and then I think about, when I think about 
interspecies communication and think about listening to non-humans. So I think about first that conversation. And then I think about how people can misunderstand. One person says, I love you. And that means one thing and somebody else hears something else entirely based on what they bring to it. And so that's even with people who speak the same language. And now think about the confusion possible, but also the communication possible. Say, I only speak English and somebody else only speaks Swahili. We can still communicate, but there is more room for error. And then think about your non-human friends that you have, like if you have any dog friends, they can tell you when they, when the water dish is empty. You know, they can look at the water dish, look at you, <laughs> and you can communicate that way, but there's still room for error and more room for error, but you both speak, you both speak a uh, mammal. And then what about a communication between you and a lizard? You both speak animal, but you don't speak mammal. So there's more room for error. And then it's even more so with the land. And I think, so I want to just first establish that it's very possible to project. And you could say, hey, the land told me it's okay to cut all down all the trees. You know, I'm sure that someone has said that at some point. And so one needs to be aware of projection but then having said that, I think the question first is, how do you listen to a lover? You know, you, listen, you learn to listen to a lover by, by time, by, by experience of listening to the other person and by having miscommunications and then working through the miscommunications. And then how do you communicate with anyone? And I think, so there's personal practice. I think it takes time. It takes listening and listening. And, and then I think it also takes social practice as well, communal practice. I once asked my friend Jeanette Armstrong, she's an Okanagan Indian writer and activist. I once asked her, where do dreams come from? And she laughed and said, everybody knows the animals give them to us. And then later, I asked, find the Loria, where dreams come from. He's a, he was a Dakota Indian, and he said they're given to us by the spirits. And I laughed, and I said, that's, but Jeanette said it's the animals. And he said, that's a hugely important question because, and he was just laughing, and he said, it's going to be different wherever you live. That if you live in a forest, the forest is going to communicate with you in a different way than if you live in a desert. And he said that there was, there are entire volumes written on Cherokee dream interpretation because they originally came from the Southeast, which is very heavily forested. And a lot of the entire religion is based on how do you navigate through this when there are all these beings around you in essentially a jungle. And that's going to be an entirely different way of listening to the world than if you live in a, in a desert, which has fewer uh, beings. So the point is, I guess I could have just said this in the first place, it's all circumstantial, it's all experience. And I think that to really learn how to listen to the land would take hundreds of years. It takes a lifetime for an individual and it takes five lifetimes for a, uh, a community. I don't know if that makes any sense. I think it makes a lot of sense and uh, thanks for that. I also feel that that leads to, sorry, but we may hold you back for a few more minutes. Uh, to another question which has been waiting there. Uh, and I think it's got a sense of immediacy. And you said earlier, uh, that for your motivations don't matter. What matters is what happens? So it's the, it's that it's the question that comes into that frame of reasoning. Uh, so Bhargavi, would you like to ask that? Are you there, Bhargavi? 
Or should I ask it? Oh, sorry, my phone was muted. Uh, yeah, so I asked this question because when I interact with uh, many, many students across colleges and universities and all, uh, the way uh, sustainable development, uh, like you uh, rightly mentioned, uh, I, I love the way you describe it, saying that anything that can go on for perpetuity. So that's exactly how chill, uh, students are growing up today with... Uh, it, you know, practically everything is being made sustainable and corporates are pushing it with this whole terminology of sustainability, sustainability index. And um, there's a lot of uh, money exchange that happens across uh, those terminologies, many projects that are being pushed in the name of sustainability. And I've also seen that um, many interventions which are actually not sustainable. Uh, Vandana did talk about zero budget earlier. In fact, the zero budget natural farming was pushed as something uh, sustainable. So with corporates pushing the money, uh, students growing up in that ambience of sustainable development, I also have heard a lot of arguments from youngsters saying that now nuclear energy is the most sustainable form of energy. And then they've also argued with me saying that genetic engineering is the only way to go if you have to feed the millions. So how do you make them understand otherwise, given that the force on the other side is so powerful and nasty and forceful and it is just a few voices on this side struggling very hard trying to make people understand so where do we start how do we do it is my question well another great question and i i think first that i've always been struck by uh, a line that I read, I don't remember by whom, back in my 20s, that, that said, it takes 10 years for someone to change their mind. And it's, um, I found that's true for me, except maybe not 10, sometimes 10, sometimes less. That when I first read John Livingston saying that he thought that evolution was based on cooperation instead of primarily competition, I thought, he's crazy. That makes no sense at all. And then a couple of three years later, I found myself no longer able to conceptualize that uh, evolution was based strictly on competition. And so I'd switched over from thinking he's crazy to agreeing with him. And so my point is, one of the things I think we can do is plant seeds, as you know very well as a, as a, as a teacher. And, and then the next thing is, to remember that, yes, they tell, the other side tells a lot of lies, but lies are really expensive to maintain and have to be repeated incessantly. And, and so for me, now to answer your actual question, if somebody were to say to me that nuclear power is sustainable, I would say first, is this true from the perspective of the land where the uranium is mined? Does it harm the land where the uranium is mined? Does it harm the place where the nuclear waste is put afterwards? Does it harm the place where the sand is mined? Does it, because concrete is, I mean, concrete is the main ingredient, frankly, in a nuclear power plant, just like it's the main ingredient of a skyscraper. And where does the sand come from? Let's follow each of these back. And do you think that those who live on the river where the sand is mined, do you think they would agree that it's sustainable? What are you trying to sustain? That's the next question is, um, is I go back to the framing conditions I mentioned earlier, but what are you trying to sustain? Because it doesn't sustain the earth, it sustains industrial civilization. And, and then after that, we can get into questions of energy return on energy investment. If we want to just look at it from the perspective of industrial civilization, you know, I, I got my physics degree from a place called the Colorado School of Mines, M-I-N-E-S. And it's an extremely conservative pro-energy school. And even at that energy school, the, uh, 
And they were very, it's a very anti-environmental school, frankly. And even there, they didn't like nuclear power and they didn't like nuclear power because of its energy return on energy investment, which is not very good compared to, for example, oil. And it's, so we can get down to brass tacks, but that's, that's not even the main point. The main point is what are you trying to sustain? And I ask again, and I, ask, I said this earlier, you know, what do blue whales want? If you ask the planet, do you want a nuclear power plant? And that this is just the question we just had. I think the, the, the planet's gonna say absolutely not, or I would have made one. And, and so far as how, how we feed X number of people, I think one of the things that we need to, to recognize is that, and I wish Vandana was still here because she could, she could handle this in her sleep. But the fact that food, years ago, I asked Anuradha Mittal, who's a, a former director of Food First, if the people of India would be better off, rural India would be better off if the global economy disappeared tomorrow. And she started laughing and said, of course. And she said, there are former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. And so the question for me is not so much, how do we feed all these people? Because because traditionally, I mean, the Talawa fed themselves here earlier. And I think I think that we need to, I just read a couple days ago about how there are new missiles that are powered by uh, specifically by biofuels made from corn. New missiles like to blow people up. And, and I'll just say this a little bit because I feel really awkward saying all this to people from India who know this stuff much better than I do. But when NAFTA was passed, it was a complete disaster for the farmers of Mexico because all of a sudden you were, the United States was exporting lots of corn from Iowa that was done on factory farms and driving small corn farmers in, in Mexico off their land. So I think when students ask, how can we feed the world? I think the question is, really, how can we in our community feed ourselves? I think that's really the way I would try to reframe it. But again, I feel really awkward saying all this to you, who I'm sure have thought about this much more than I have. Thank you. Yeah, so, so Prabha, I think we, I mean, it's probably very late for you, Derek, but uh, I can see that David Sparrow wants to comment. Uh, will that comment be brief, David? David, are you there? I think David has left, but I just had a couple of thoughts, which I thought uh, when you said earlier in the conversation that the only problem with the way in which we are conditioned to think is that we are conditioned not to dream. Uh, so I mean, this is a commonly used phrase in the kind of education that we have across India now. Uh, it's like stop dreaming, start thinking. Stop wondering, start thinking. So uh, it, it produces a certain kind of human condition. And we have a majority of the students trained by this type of what is claimed to be education, right? So it creates 
the forms of work that we now see around us, uh, which is largely based on extraction and uh, a very mechanistic interrelationship with everything around us. And also the kind of insularity with which people are being asked to live, especially now. In fact, just before this conversation started, I saw a friend who actually does a lot to protect the trees and he put out a note saying, it's raining outside and he said, stay safe, stay home. And I was thinking, why can't you go out and get wet in the rain? You know, uh, so it's this type of thinking that stay safe, stay home because there is a virus out there. Uh, I can understand how to relate with the virus, but does it require me to be locked inside a home, right? So we have created a world where we have created billions of little prisons. And your con this conversation was about not just rescuing ourselves from these little prisons, uh, big or small, uh, but also rescuing ourselves from imprisoning the entire uh, process of life from our misdoings. So to me, it seems like we are all on a boat and uh, it's like we have, some of us have little legacies and some of us have the idea of greater legacies, mega legacies. So depending on the power we have, we all want a piece of the boat. I might take a small plank because I am not very powerful, but somebody who is extraordinarily powerful may take a bigger chunk of the boat. Now, that's the type of world we have created. So I'm just sharing this to also contextualize what's happening in India now is actually extremely alarming, but also uh, people who are forced to leave places which could potentially have nourished them and built a life of dignity and went and worked as migrant, so-called migrant workers in cities to build cities, uh, like Vandana said before, are being forced back because they are a nuisance. You don't know how to deal with them. You don't know what to do with them. So you force them to walk or you put them in trains and make the trains run around the country without food and water inside. So they created this kind of entrapments. So I'm just sharing these thoughts to you know, see what you have to say uh, in terms of the way in which uh, the world is going to play itself out in the immediate future. I think it is a grave error to presume that those who have acted a certain way on a system that has caused certain things to happen in the past will not do so in the future, will not continue It's like I knew this woman many years ago, but one of her favorite things to say was, if somebody tells you something bad about himself on the first date, believe him. And it's, it's, this is what the dominant culture, we can call it civilization, we can call it whatever we want and we can discuss it if you want. But this is what it has done from the beginning as Vandana was talking about that it groups people into categories of those on the inside who privatize profits and externalize costs those who are on land that you want to take, who are extraneous and must be removed or eliminated. The workers, those you need, at least temporarily, those you need to use. 
and those who are simply extra who must either be left to starve or be eliminated in some other way. And this applies to non-humans as well. And so I'm just agreeing with what you said and then saying that this is what this culture has done for a long time. And we can expect that it will continue to do so until it stopped. See, there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, I read uh, many years ago, I read a very good book on abusive dynamics called uh, Why Does He Do That? Inside the Minds of Anchoring and Controlling Men by Lundy Bancroft. And one of the points he makes in there is that it's a cliche that we've all heard, but there's some truth in it, that addicts don't often quit until they hit bottom. And we've all either known someone or had someone in some part of our life somewhere who, for example, might have been a heroin addict who was in trouble. And so I've known some functional heroin addicts too, but I've also known some people who've destroyed their lives and they don't quit using until their lives are destroyed and they, to use a cliche, hit bottom. He said, but there's a problem, which is those who are addicted to control over others, they don't hit bottom, everyone else does. And so they don't stop. They continue to exploit and exploit and exploit. And that's part of the problem and part of the problem we face is that the dominant culture is not hitting bottom. Salmon are hitting bottom. The oceans are hitting bottom. Those people who are walking on those, walking all those miles and the people on the trains, they're hitting bottom. And we, we sometimes like to ask rhetorically, how do those in power sleep at night? Well, very well, thank you very much, in satin sheets. And one of the things that has become clear to me, and I brought up the thing about the discussion between me and Chris Hedges earlier, one of the things that's very clear to me is that those in power won't stop until we stop them. And I want to tell you about a conversation that I had 20, 25 years ago now with Jeanette Armstrong that at the time I'd been an activist for five or six years and I was undergoing sort of a breakdown where I was just bursting into sobs several times a week. And a lot of my activist friends, so Derek, you know, you're crying too much. You need to take some time off. The problems will still be there when you come back. And I knew that that wasn't what I needed to do because if you're not going to cry about the death of the salmon, what do tears mean? You know? And, and one day I called Jeanette Armstrong and I said, you know, this work, this work is breaking my heart. And she said, yeah, I know, it'll do that. And then I said, the dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? She said, yeah, it does, even itself. And I said, unless it stop, the dominant culture is gonna kill everything on the planet, isn't it? And she said, yeah, it is, unless it stopped. And then I said, we're not gonna make it to some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? And she said the best thing she could possibly say, which is, I've been waiting for you to say that. And the reason that was the best thing she could possibly say is it because it normalized my despair. And it let me know that despair is an appropriate response to a, desperate few, to a desperate situation. And it let me know that the sorrow is just sorrow and the pain is just pain. 
And we spend more energy trying to avoid feeling them than just feeling them. And we can feel all those things and it's not gonna kill us. And we can also feel all those things and it does something even better than not killing us, which is it does kill us. And there's a wonderful thing about being dead, which is once you're dead, they can't touch you anymore. Not through their false promises, not through threats. And I don't mean being dead, dead. What I mean is there's a moment when you give up on the system completely and you say, it's not going to stop unless we stop it. And that is tremendously liberating to recognize that this is capitalism and this is what it does. And this is, you can't mess around at the edges. Well, you can mess around at the edges. I'm not, I don't believe in the revolution versus reformed dichotomy. Um, I believe that if we all wait for the great glorious revolution, there's not going to be anything left when we get there. And at the same time, if all we do is reform work, then this culture is going to grind away until there's nothing left. I believe that we need to do reform work and we need to have that great glorious revolution as well. We need to, I sometimes unfairly get pegged as the violence guy because I believe that sometimes it's okay to fight back, but it's not true. I'm the everything guy. And to take it back to your question, I don't know what to do for those people who are walking specifically. I'm not there. I don't know. You know better than I, and they know better than both of us probably. And I don't know. I don't know what they need. I don't know what we can do about that circumstance right now. What I do know, it is, it is entirely predictable. It is as predictable as if someone takes poison and then they, their body suffers the effects of those poisons. It is just as predictable. I hope that's at least somewhat relevant to what you were saying. I think it is, and thanks for that, that quality of response. So Suprabha? Um, how do we uh, how do we go further how do we go on how do we where do we go next well I was hoping that you would ask what we do because um because I can't tell people what to do. And the reason I can't tell people what to do is because I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And I do have a series of questions that people have asked me that have really helped. And the first question is what do you love? Because whatever you love, it's under assault. And if what you love is the land where you live, protect it. If what you love is sea turtles, protect them. If what you love is long form discourse. Long form discourse is very important to me. That's why I write big books because I am horrified by, there are things that you can't discuss in 10 seconds. And there are things you can't discuss in 10 minutes. And there are things you can't discuss in 10 weeks that take 10 years to discuss and take 10 lifetimes to discuss. And I, one of the things I am fighting for is long form discourse. And where you bring up an idea, you explore it, you reject it, you accept it again. Anyway, so what do you love? Maybe, maybe you love women. And like Bandana Shiva was talking about, women are dying because of femicide and, or genocide, G-Y-N-O-Side. And maybe what you love is the ability of children to think for themselves. And so whatever it is you love, fight for it. And the second question is, 
kind of similar, it seems, but it's very different, which is what do you get off on doing? And I love the sort of vulgar language there instead of what do you love doing? Because what do you love doing is like a personal ad. You know, I love walks on the beach, et cetera. You know, I get off on trying to figure out the relationship between perceived entitlement, exploitation, and atrocity. That's what I get off on doing. And so, I mean, of course I'm a writer because I've condemned myself to a life of homework and I love it. And other people love transplanting plants and other people, oh, I had a friend, she called me up one day, we're just chatting, I said, what are you gonna do later? She said, I'm gonna go over to Walmart and I'm gonna leaflet outside. And I was like, that's horrifying to me. I couldn't do that, but she loved doing it. You know, she loves, she loves standing and standing and holding a sign at a, at a protest. She loves picketing. She loves doing that stuff. I'm an introvert. I can do this, but I can't like work a phone tree. I can't, or I was doing, so, so that's, that's, that, that's the, the next thing. And the next thing is, the third question really is, what are your gifts? Well, there's four questions. The third question is, what are your gifts and how can you use them in defense of your land base or in the service of your land base? And there are people, my mom had a tremendous green thumb and she could, she could, she could touch a plant and it's happy. I don't have that. You know, different people have different gifts. I was working on timber sale appeals, which is stopping illegal timber sales by the federal government. And I would spend all day working on trying to rip apart some document and it would be very frustrating. I was bad at it. And, uh, and somebody else would come in who was really good at it. He could pick apart a document just like that. Or I have a friend who has argued and actually literally wrote the book on fighting the California Department of Forestry. And she has argued before the, the Supreme Court and she loves developing legal arguments. And she gets off on doing it. She's really good at it. I don't have a gift for legal arguments. I have a gift for, for what I do. But so different people have different gifts. And so when people who are 20 years old say, what should I do? What should I do now? I always spend, I always say you should spend your next five or 10 years figuring out what your gifts are so you can use them for the rest of your life. And then the fourth thing is what are the largest, most pressing problems you can help to solve using the gifts that are unique to you and all the universe. And so, you know, one of the reasons I write the books I do is because I saw that there was a hole in discourse. And instead of just going, gosh, I wish there were books that were written about this. I did it myself. Or Dar Jamail, he's one of my heroes. He, uh, he was really upset at how the United States press was covering the United States invasion of Iraq. And instead of just complaining about it, he went to Iraq and did a better job. And so what we need to do is we need to find out what we love and we need to fight like hell to defend it. Two, we need to figure out what we get off on doing because I'm never gonna get burned out because I love what I'm doing. Three, we need to uh, figure out what our gifts are. And fourth, we need to figure out what problems that, that, the, that, the, that the planet needs for us to solve. Or that, or that society needs for us to solve. If, if, if your primary concern, if one's primary concern, okay, one more story about this. I know a woman who used to run the battered women's program for the state of New York, and now she's an advocate for women in the court system of New York. She's great, she's wonderful. And she asks every man she sees, what will it take for men to stop beating on women? You know, you get in a taxi cab with her, and she will say, let's go to, can we go to Central Park, please? And by the way, what's it going to take for men to stop beating on women? Do never, never, ever get on the subway with this woman. She's relentless. And I would never ask her to work on salmon issues because she's working on her thing and that's full time. And it takes a lifetime to work on those issues. And so, you know, find out what, 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 what you love, defend it, and never give in.
That's it. Wow. Leo, shall we? Yes, sure. How are you doing, Derek? Are you are you okay? Um, I'm all, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, you set this up, so I will. Yeah. I'm I'm happy if you want to quit, and I'm happy if you want to do another question. Whatever you want to do, I'm yours. Well, Leo, Leo should have the chance to. Well, I think we've kind of gone through most of the questions, so there are really many comments, and I guess we can send you those comments, Derek. Lots of uh, uh, thank yous and compliments and wows to both of you uh, for joining this discussion. Uh, we also see that there's been, you know, not really comments or questions, but a lot of uh, uh, you know, people saying that they really, really enjoyed this conversation. So I think that's a nice note to leave it at. And uh, hopefully this is a, a promise we can make each other that uh, very soon we'll actually be able to meet in, in real ways. Uh, no, this wasn't bad. Right? So a, I love that. And B, I just want to, uh, I think we should all express gratitude to you and Supi for your wonderful job of, of putting this on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of people came together on this and I'm really, really happy. About 400 people signed up. Uh, in one way or the other, they are there and you can see lots of people are watching on Facebook. So I think this recording will help us to go back to and, uh, you know, rekindle our own sense of things. Uh, so I, what I like about it is a lot of open-ended answers. There were no, nothing which was uh, closed. So, which is nice, so that each one figures out their own pathway. Uh, but generally, I think we are headed in the right direction. At least those of us who are in this group. So that's a nice thing. Uh, so we shouldn't worry about those who are headed in the wrong direction because they're going to head our way hopefully soon. Uh, yeah, I think that's the note on which I would like to say that this video will be available on uh, YouTube channel of ESG India. And also it will be available on ESGindia.org. Uh, uh, it's already available on Facebook live. You just have to go to Environment Support Group page and uh, uh, the group site and you'll find it there. Uh, so yeah, really, thank you very much, uh, Derek. Uh, of course, thanks to Vandana, she had to leave earlier. Uh, but it must be pretty late for you there now. Though you might want to continue the conversation, I think I would rather have the conversation with you being there and we could share a beer or something. <laughs> Or go for a walk in the redwood forests. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Good night, Derek, and thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>